you're going to be sorely disappointed. Uh, the book of Judges, chapter 15, is where we're going to be at today, uh, looking at a portion of the life of a man named Samson. And uh, he was a judge of Israel, and, um, and so he played an important role in the life of the nation of Israel. A lot of, a lot of what we learn from the Bible about Samson is that yes, Samson was a mighty man. He was a strong man. Uh, God had blessed him with that. But uh, a lot of Samson's life was really a demonstration of what not to do. How not to do something. And, uh, but God used him. And God had a role for that man. And even though uh, he abused the gift of God, and even though he... Um, used the, God, the gift that God had given him of his great strength many times for very selfish purposes, God still had a plan to use him, and God used him for 20 years to judge Israel before his, uh, before his death. And um, a lot of times, that's what most, most anybody you ask about Samson, all they're going to remember is him and Delilah. That's, most, that's what most people, you talk about David, they're going to think about David and Bathsheba. They always, all, that old mind, that old worldly mind, it goes right to the fleshly things, doesn't it? All right, so if you got your place in Judges chapter 15, and uh, let's ask the Lord to bless the Sunday school today. Our Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the opportunity to uh, stand here and teach the adult class once again for uh, Brother Barry Jones. And uh, Lord, we do thank you for what you're doing for him and how you're healing him and bringing him along. Lord, we pray it won't be very long before he's back here in his rightful place teaching his class that you've uh, put under his charge. And uh, Lord, pray that you'll just help him with that and help Lisa, uh, Lord, as she uh, heals up as well. Keep your hand upon each and every one of us, Lord. We need your power every day and your providence, Lord, and your presence, but we also need your protection. And Lord, we don't need it just during this time, but we need it every day. And the old songwriter had it right, Lord, when he wrote, I need thee every hour. But Lord, I need thee every second of every minute of every hour. And I ask Holy Spirit today that you will um, come down and feel me and speak through me, Lord, to the things that we need to hear today concerning this man, Samson, and his fight against the Philistines. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Now, I can't speak for Brother Barry uh, Jones, but I did talk with him uh, the day before yesterday. And um, if you pray really hard, he might actually get to be back with us next Sunday teaching his class again. I know you would like that. Barry is an excellent teacher, and I know that you have missed him being here teaching you these lessons. So this morning, uh, we want to talk about this man, Samson. Now, this particular lesson today is going to deal really with one subject that everybody probably has a problem with, and that's vengeance, revenge. Has anybody ever done anything to you before and you wanted to get revenge for it? You wanted to get them back, you know? Uh, you you kind of were living by that... Uh, uh, by that philosophy, I don't get mad, I get even. And, uh, but you know what? Uh, there's been times in my life where I've seized the opportunity to get even, and it don't feel near as good as you think it's going to. Matter of fact, it never feels as good as you think it's going to feel. You never, you never can seem to shed that, uh, that guilt of knowing that you've done wrong and knowing that you're done against what the Bible says because the Bible does not endorse personal vengeance. The Bible says vengeance is mine, is what the Lord says. He said, I'll repay. I'll take care of that. So today we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to see here in this lesson how anger and revenge got into Samson's life. And if you follow the life of Samson on through for a couple more chapters through the 17th chapter, you'll find that it was anger and revenge in the heart of Samson that eventually cost him his life. Uh, technically, he committed suicide, and, uh, but, and, but the Bible says he killed more Philistines in his death than he ever did in his life. So uh, we see that that kind, of, that kind of revenge cost him his life. Now, 
um, as we look at Samson today, was he completely innocent? Was, was he the complete victim of somebody doing him wrong? No, not exactly. Uh, Samson was just as guilty as the Philistines were. And uh, I guess if we really want to go back for just a moment, let's take a moment and, and consider a, a, little, a little bit of background to how we got here to this passage of Scripture in Judges 15, beginning in verse number 9. The trouble kind of got started back in chapter 14 when uh, Samson, uh, Samson's eye fell on a Philistine girl. And boy, he really liked her. He thought she was pretty. And he, he, was, uh, he said, she pleases me. And so he went to his mom and daddy. He said, I want you to go get that girl for me. I want to make her my wife. I really like her. And his mom and daddy said, well, son, is there not a woman of all of the nation of Israel, you know, of your own people that, uh, that, you, that you find beautiful and you like to have your wife? He said, no, I want her. I want this Philistine woman. Well, you know what, friend, when you, when, you, when you enter into a supposedly a lifetime relationship with a person who is your mortal enemy or whose people is your mortal enemy, uh, you're going to have trouble. You, you're setting yourself up for trouble, and uh, that's kind of what, what the start of all this was. Now, uh, there's a principle in this lesson today that we need to learn, and that is, is that God wants us to turn those hurtful events in our life over to Him and let Him make them right and not us make them right. And so like I said to begin with, it seems like that this uh, man Samson's life was a display of what not to do rather than what to do when facing the temptation to have vengeance on other people. Now Samson was a man that was truly gifted by God. Uh, and his gift was great physical strength. I mean, this guy was just unbelievable. And, uh, I mean, just as strong as he could be, and that's what he was known for. And, and, and God equipped him with great strength. Uh, the Bible says that no man but ever before him had. He was the strongest man that ever lived. There was nobody that had strength like old Samson did. And so we see that... Uh, he was able to accomplish great feats, and some of those feats are recorded here in the Bible for us. But as I said, he used that gift many times for selfish reasons and for a, a self-serving purpose. Now, when we come to the 15th chapter of uh, the book of Judges, we're going to find that the nation of Israel is not free. The nation of Israel is under the control of the Philistines. Now, if you want proof of that, you can just shoot your eyes back a few verses to chapter 14 and verse 4, and it'll tell us at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now, <clears throat> when Samson takes his wife of the Philistines, things go along pretty good for a little while and uh, don't seem to have a whole lot of problems. And one day, old Samson, he's walking along through the vineyards there in, in Timnath, and he, and he sees a lion. Now, the Bible said it was a young lion, so I, I don't know if it was, a, I don't know if it was a, a, a big male lion. It was full of mane, and, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a real lion, them things stand, they're, they're stand on all fours tall as we are. Humongous animals. But it said it was a young lion, and, but regardless of what size it was, it doesn't matter. I don't even know why I said that. But anyway, the thing, uh, the thing uh, wanted to stand off old Samson. Well, now, if you got out there in the middle of a vineyard somewhere and you really didn't have any hiding place or nowhere to climb or nowhere to go, and uh, a, a lion shows up and stands you off, what are you going to do? You know, other than maybe drop dead or pass out or... You certainly can't run from the thing. Well, you know what Samson did? Samson fought that blooming thing, and he killed it. I mean, killed it with his bare hands. Didn't have a sword, didn't have a spear, didn't have anything. Killed that thing with his bare hands and just left the carcass laying there. It's great strength. Well, a few days later, he was walking by through Timnath again, 
And he happened to see that old dead lion's carcass laying there, and he noticed there was a swarm of bees humming around that thing. And he went over to check that thing out, and them bees had made that old dead lion's carcass uh, uh, like a, 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 a hive to make honey. And there was honey down in the carcass of that lion, and boy, he, old Samson bit down, started to... Uh, eating on that honey, and boy, he liked it. He liked that, and got, took some to his mom and daddy, you know, and they ate it. And, and then he decided he'd be a little smart, so he, he told his Philistine brethren by marriage, he said, I, I want to pose a little riddle to you. So he gives them a riddle about, that, about the uh, lion and the honey in the line, and he says, I'm going to make a bet with you. He didn't have any business doing that. And he said, uh, I'm going to make a bet with you. He said, if you can't figure out my riddle in seven days, he said, uh, you're going to owe me uh, 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 some changes of garment and other things, but if you figure it out in seven days, then I owe you. And old Samson thought he had them, you know. But Samson's wife was a Philistine, right? Well, it comes down to day seven, and they ain't figured the riddle out yet. And so they come to Samson's wife. And they said, you get that boy of yours, you get that man husband of yours to tell us or to tell you the answer to that riddle or we're going to kill you. We're going to kill you and your daddy. And boy, they're serious about that thing. So, so she goes and goes to squalling and crying to Samson and, and says, uh, why, why don't you tell me the answer to that riddle? You, you, you don't even love me. You hate me because you won't tell me the answer to that riddle. He said, well, I ain't even told my own mom and daddy. Why should I tell you? And she goes on, squalls, kicking and screaming and pitching a big fit. Of course, if I was under threat of being uh, murdered, I don't know how I'd feel about that thing. But finally, old Samson gave in to her and told her the answer to the riddle. You know what she done? Was her faithfulness to her husband? No. She ran straight to them Philistines and told them the answer to that riddle. Well, then they thought they was something. Do you see the tension building? I'm trying to give you a foundation. Do you see the tension building? Started with taking a wife of a sworn enemy, and it's just getting worse and worse all the time. So now the Philistines come to him, and uh, they, they, they say, hey, we got your answer. We got your riddle figured out here. We got your riddle all figured out. And uh, we, know what, um, we know what the answer is, and they give him the answer. And in chapter 14, verse 18, he said this to those Philistines. He said unto them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. In other words, you didn't figure this thing out on your own. You had to get the answer from my wife. First revenge takes place. So as we come into uh, the last two verses of chapter 14, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. Now you've got to remember back in the Old Testament day, the Holy Spirit did not come upon a person and abide with him forever like it is now. The Lord would put his spirit upon a man and take it back off again as was needed for the will of God. You'll remember when David, later on, that when David sinned against Bathsheba, when Nathan came to expose the sin, Nathan, uh, David cried out to the Lord and asked the Lord, Take not thy spirit from me, because the spirit was on him. And so it came upon Samson, and Samson was able to rise up, and you know what he done? He killed 30 Philistines. So what did that do to the Philistines? Well, the Philistines got mad. And so the Bible tells us that when we come into chapter number 15, that Samson goes down to visit his wife. He wants to go see his wife. They don't have the best of relationships, but they want it. he wants to see her anyway. And when he gets down there, her Philistine daddy refuses to let Samson see his wife. He said, oh, uh, well, she told me that you hated her. So see, she runs to daddy. And, and let me tell you, if I wanted to go off in that direction, I could go off in that direction and preach a little while or teach a little while. 
on how nosy parents getting their nose in their children's homes causes lots of problems. So he's done took, he's done took his daughter and has said, Phew, uh, he hates you, forget him. We're going to give you to another. So he gives her to a, a companion of, uh, of Samson's. He says, you can have her to wife. And Samson gets down there, I want to see my wife. You ain't got no wife. You're not going to see her. I gave her to your companion. What did you do that for? Well, because you said that you, said that, uh, you hated her. So what does Samson do? Revenge. Captures 300 foxes. And he puts firebrands on their tails and ties them together and sends them out through the cornfield and through the olive vineyard and burns up the entire corn crop and all the olive crop, burns it slap to the ground with them 300 foxes. So what do the Philistines do? Revenge. Revenge. So they come back now and they go back to Samson's wife and to Samson's father. And they kill him. And they burn him with fire. Now how do the Philistines know to kill Samson's wife and father? Because they went and said, who burned up our corn crop? Who burned up our olive vineyards? And they said, that was Samson that did that. And so they go in retaliation and they kill Samson's wife and father-in-law. Doesn't sound like much of a way to live, is it? So Samson finds out that his wife and father-in-law are now dead. And what does Samson do in verses 7 and 8? He goes out and he kills more Philistines. It's just back and forth. Back and forth. There's no healing. There's only harm. There's only war and not peace. And so when we come to our lesson in verse number 9, it's now time for the Philistines to take their turn at revenge again. And so they come up in verse number 9, and they went up and they spread themselves, uh, the Bible says in verse 9, and they pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. Now, they do this without announcing their coming. They just show up at this place called Lehi. And the men of Judah who are under oppression, under the capture of the Philistines, under the control of the Philistines, they go out there and they say, why, why are you here? Why have you come up here and spread yourself uh, up here at Lehi? We've not done anything to you. Well, why are you here? And they said, we're here to bind Samson and to do to him as he hath done to us. You know, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus gave us the golden rule. And the golden rule has been misinterpreted to say, do unto others as they do unto us. It's not what it says, is it? It says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But Samson is living by the, 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 the philosophy, and so are the Philistines. What you do to us, we're going to do to you. So the Bible tells us in verse 11, Then 3,000 men of Judah went up to the top of the rock, Edom, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, listen to this statement, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And what are you doing up here? Now, Samson's took the high ground. And this back and forth revenge is going on. And it's eating the people up. And a lot of people are dying over this. And Samson, the, the, the men of Judah said, You know, we're, we're kind of afraid of these people. What, what, are, you, what are you making them mad for? Well, what are you doing to them? What did you do to make them so mad at us that they've come up here to that, that they've come up here to bind you and take you? He said, "I didn't do anything to them that they hadn't done to me." Now you can point fingers all day long, and say whose fault it is and who started it. 
But the fact of the matter is they're, they're in a dead heat here of revenge one against the other and it is a vicious cycle that never seems to have an end. So Samson asked them, or, or basically indicates to them, what are, you, what are you doing here? And they said that the men of Judah, in verse 12, they said, well, we've come down to bind thee that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. Go ahead and bind me if you want to. Well, Samson knew they wasn't going to be able to put anything on him that was going to hold him anyway. He said, but you promised me you're not going to kill me. No, no. They said, they said in verse number 13, No, no, we will we'll but bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. Do you know what we see here in this passage of Scripture? We see the age-old policy of appeasement. It, it, it goes on today. We claim as the United States to be the friend of Israel. We claim to be Israel's ally. These are God's people, the nation of Israel. And even the people of God are practicing a policy of appeasement. And what they want to do is to make Israel have to give up something in exchange for peace. Did you know that in, in the in the 20th and into the 21st century beginning with President Jimmy Carter and every president that has occupied the White House since Jimmy Carter with the exception of Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump each president including the Bushes made Israel give up something in exchange for peace in favor of the Palestinians now, the Palestinians are the direct descendants of the Philistines. So this, this, this battle that's going on in the Middle East now between the Palestinians and the, and the Israelites, th this isn't something new. This isn't something that happened a few years ago. This is something that happened thousands of years ago and still goes on today. And so the people of God, because they're afraid of the Philistines, are willing to give up one of, of the strongest men, the strongest man in the nation of Israel. They're willing to give him up to the Philistines in exchange for peace. A peace that will never come. There will never be peace in the Middle East until the millennium. Mark that down. There will never be peace over there until the millennium. Now when Jesus comes in the millennium, never mind, I'm getting way off of my topic here. So they, they do that very thing. And um, they bind him best they can. Take him down from the rock there and take him down into down into Lehi where the Philistines are waiting on him. And the Bible says in verse 14 in chapter 15 of our text, And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi. In the English, he called it Jawbone Hill. That's what he called it. You know, back in the old west, they always, every old town had a boot hill, you know. That's where they buried all the bad guys that got shot. Well, when, jo when Samson got, I didn't took Solomon, turned him into Joshua, and he's supposed to be Samson. But when Samson got done with him, he said, now this will always be known as Jawbone Hill. This is where a thousand Philistines fell. 
So God brought a great victory in the nation of Israel. But just as Brother Mike was, was leading us into the introduction of the lesson this morning, he gave an excellent illustration about the cut worm. That was excellent. And it leads us to understand that even when we are doing the work of the Lord, that there is the possibility that if we don't operate in the Spirit and not in the flesh, that we can do a right thing the wrong way. Was it right to kill the enemy of God? Well, sure it was. I mean, you know, the Philistines were the sworn enemy of God's people. And that was great that all of this took place. But he did it in the wrong way. He did it with vengeance. Now, when we come to the last two verses of the lesson, I honestly, I honestly... have a time with this. Actually, back in verse 18, when the battle was over and, and Solomon had destroyed those Philistines, he makes a statement to the Lord that to me is, is very arrogant. And in verse 18, it says, And he was sore athirst, and called on the Lord, and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst, and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Rather than falling down on his knees and thanking God for the strength and for the, and for the power to bring a great victory in the life of God's people, he said, Now, I've done, done a good work down here, and I'm about to thirst to death. He said, you're going to let me thirst to death, God, and let me die and fall in the hands of these Philistines anyway? But in verse number 19, the Bible says, But God clave an hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. And wherefore he called the name of the place in Hakkorah, which is in Lehi unto this day, and he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. God had a plan for this man's life. So I guess the, what the takeaway that we want to get from the lesson today is that Samson used the strength that God had given him, but he used it in a very unpure manner. One of his big violations was that he he violated his Nazarite vow, which one of, the, one of the vows of a Nazarite was to not touch anything dead. He did that twice in our, in our scripture today. He touched the lion after it was dead, then he touched the, the dead ass to take the jawbone of the ass. He did great works, but he violated his convictions. Samson's thirst for personal vengeance never led to peace between himself and the Philistines or with Israel. The only thing Samson ever accomplished with his life was more war and more fighting. If there's anything that we want to learn this morning and take away from our lesson is that desire for vengeance is dangerous because it can quickly overtake you and put you from a place where you think you're a victor and make you a victim. Let's bow our heads. The Father, thank you for this lesson on Samson today. And Lord, as we just took a panoramic view of this situation, Lord, we have to admit that Samson was not free and clear. He really maybe should never have taken a wife of his mortal enemy. It caused him trouble time and again and had such a vengeance in his heart. But yet you wrought the victory for your people. And you used him for 20 years. But we also know that that vengeful heart of his wound up getting him captured, getting him placed into slavery, and eventually cost him his life. 
And so, Lord, help us as your children to not only do right, that's a given, but may we do it, do right the right way, not our way. Lord, we pray that you'd bless our teacher, that he could be back with us again next Sunday and pick up in the lessons. And Lord, we ask you to dismiss the Sunday school class with your grace and mercy and bless the 11 o'clock hour, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming to Sunday school.